Good morning, China. Hello, Aldo. Hello, Hello Ali. All the students from Barcelona and Russia are looking at you. We have, you have all your power eyes on you. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, a second. Yeah, I'm also going to uh, um, officially launch the global lectures of 2017. We have Moscow and Barcelona connected with China with this first edition. Mexico will connect uh, a bit later. And uh, well, it's a pleasure to, to start with you, Ali. So good luck for the first global lecture of this edition. Perfect. Uh, first of all, hello to everybody different time zones, so I hope by now you started uh, great GSS in 2017. So today I had the pleasure to introduce this friend of mine, Andrew Haas. Uh, me and Andrew started knowing each other back in 2010, I guess, right? Yep. Back in 2010, we both, uh, we both working in the Beijing and uh, after that, and Andrew continued his journey going to AA and study in NTEC program and later on joined the distinguished offices like Zaha Hadid. And right now he's working in the special geometry event, event. Advanced Digital Design Group yeah, in, the, SO. in SOM New York. Uh, so with this a very brief introduction, I will give him the, the mic. and. Uh, I hope by now everything is clear right, for the voice. So, let me go. Should we bring this in there? So can see how much we I'm not sure if we go there. Uh, this is your seat. Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, it should be fine. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can see it. We can see it. Um, can you can see the screen? Yes. Yes, yes we see it. Okay. All right, if there are any issues, let me or Ali know and, and we'll interrupt, okay? Hello? Okay, so I'll get started. All right, so as, as Elise said, I'm part of the Advanced Digital Design Group at SOM New York. Um, I've been there for uh, just under a year or so, coming from Zaha's in London for a couple of years, and I was teaching at the Architectural Association as part of their um, AA Media Studies. Um, so we'll get, we'll get started. Um, today we're going to be looking at cities, and I'll try to explain why it's important to rethink how we design them, and kind of look at a multidisciplinary approach to better understand how they can develop and grow in a more optimized and efficient manner in the future. Covering a wide range of topics, uh, this research that I'm presenting today has kind of been part of uh, the basis of my MR thesis at the Architectural Association and my research um, assistantship at the University of Hong Kong in 2014. Um, and it's been ongoing research that uh, I've been teaching at AA visiting schools and other workshops um, around the world. Um, emergence is a concept uh, that appears in many disciplines, and it's strongly correlated to artificial intelligence, complexity theory, cybernetics, and general systems theory. Um, basically, in simplest terms, emergence describes the properties of a system that cannot be deduced from its components, meaning it's something more than the sum of its parts. So essentially, every higher level physical property can be described as a consequence of its lower level properties. Uh, so the task for architecture is to formulate a working concept of emergence, mathematics, and processes that can make it useful to us as designers. This means we must search for the principles of organization and interaction within our natural systems through an understanding of the mathematical laws that they obey. Um, we should start by, by asking, what is it that emerges in our designs? Um, and how is emergence produced? 
Um, so, as we will focus on the interchange of ideas and techniques between the discipline of mathematics and biology. Um, the originating concepts and subsequent development of, mer of emergence are founded in the interchange of these disciplines. Um, they are, they are set between them are often blurred. Um, these convergence lines were initiated in the 20th century, particularly in the work of Darcy Wentworth Thompson and, and Alfred North Whitehead. Um, they proposed organisms can be regarded as systems and these systems acquire their complex forms and patterns of behavior through the interactions in uh, space and over time um, of their components. But to start with that Darcy Wentworth Thompson, um, he was a mathematician and a zoologist. Um, he regarded the mathematical forms of living things as a diagram of the forces acting upon them. This means that nothing is shaped by accident. Every object in nature is a diagram of the forces of events and events of which they've encountered. Um, so, um, if you go from the river and examine it smooth and rounded, and you think about when it first entered the river as a sharp fragment of a larger rock, this is an erosion that shaped this material into being. So, all of it is travel in the way in which you can measure how it became its current form. So, he suggested a new way, a new mode of analysis to quantify the metrics of biology. Each Morphological measurement of an organism, a specific, maybe specific to a species or an individual, he believed that there are underlying re relations between them that do not vary, which he described as homology. So, homology has two distinct meanings. Um, to biologists, it means organs or body parts that are the same evolutionary origin but are quite different functions. Mathematicians is a classification of geometric figures according to their properties. So Thompson pioneered the idea that forms can be described by mathematical data through mapping points in 3D coordinate space and through their dimensions, angles, and curvature. It allows for comparisons of related forms that have been distorted from one another uh, by Cartesian deformations of coordinates. So understanding this idea of Cartesian deformation um, requires us to look at how things transform over time. So to do this, we have to look at the work of Alfred North Whitehead. So Alfred North Whitehead was a mathematician and philosopher. Um, he proposed that nothing in the world is really this. Um, so we tend to see things in our physical world as... Okay, I see you again. Audio? Audio test? Turn on the mic. He's muted. Unmute. Can you hear okay. me? Yes, I can. Okay. okay. <laughs> Can you hear this? Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Continue. Okay. One second. Okay, you can still see. Yes. Yes, yes second. You can go on. Okay. So we were talking about Alfred North Whitehead. Uh, so he was basically talking about how things in the world aren't really fixed. They kind of just appear that way because of uh, David uh, through time. And so it's, it's transformed the morphologies, but it's all just at different scales of time. And for us to really... Um, the development of morphology and evolution, we need to kind of free ourselves of, of what we think of as permanent and what we think of as in change. So 
um, our view of, of the world is really that of just human perception. So this shift of our mindset in terms of scale is key to understanding how everything around us develops and grows. So the physics of the development of sand dunes, for example, was one of the first complex processes studied um, intensely in a mathematical way. The patterns in a sand dune, they're, they're formed at multiple, uh, they form in um, are multiple, and they vary at multiple scales, uh, degrees or weeks. Uh, shift at a global scale over months, years, or even decades. So all of them are intricately linked there, affecting the pattern of their development in an entirely cohesive manner. Um, so Wade had argued that process, rather than self, the fundamental principle of the world. Um, nature consists of the pattern of activity interacting with each other. So our bundles of relationships that maintain themselves by adjusting their own behavior in anticipation of changes to patterns of activity all around them. Uh, this anticipation and, and response is what makes up the dynamics of life's processes. So these two groups of ideas, Thompson and Whitehead, is a very interesting thing for design so uh, emerge from process it is a process that produces elaborates and maintains the form of organism that consists of complex series of exchanges between the organisms and its environment in that forms are, are related by monogenetic tendencies it's a model map. Um, really relevant to us, um, as in recent years, both architecture and engineering have been preoccupied with process and form finding to generate designs in both physical and computational environments. Behavior can get related to the environment and a particular behavior will produce different results in different environments, or could be performed by different forms in the same environment. Behavior is nonlinear and it's uh, context specific. So, options of behavior can help describe how organisms and phenomena maintain themselves over time, establishing an understanding of pattern formation and self-organization in biological systems. So all, all biological organisms and natural non-living organisms are maintained by the flow of energy through their systems. These patterns of flow are, are subject to variations and adjusted through the feedbacks which attempt to maintain the equilibrium of the system. So occasionally there is such an amplification that these systems must reorganize or collapse the behavioral order emerges from the chaos of a system. Organization. So every time that this happens, a more complex structure with a higher flow of energy through it is in turn more susceptible to future fluctuations. If self-organized systems to ever increase in complexity, it's evolutionary development and allows for dynamic systems to emerge in nature. Um, pattern and feedback in the models of a dynamic system. Um, in the relationship of morphogenesis and genetic coding, it is not the exact form or pattern of the organism that is genetically encoded it's for the process that itself generate the form or pattern within the environment. The striped um, there is a genetic DNA. Andrew, Andrew, yeah. we are losing yeah. you a little bit. Can I, can I ask you to talk a little bit slower? Uh, because I mean, we have not English speaker, not all of them, uh, me included. Um, so yeah, just probably a little bit slower, and I'll interrupt you if we cannot hear you. Okay. 
Let me know if it's okay. All right, sample the stripes on a zebra. So there is a genetic code within the DNA. It's for to develop black and white stripes. What it doesn't do is instruct exactly the shapes and placement stripes. These attributes are developed at an embryological stage of growth based on the forces acting upon them from the development. The two evolution is over a longer period, which instructs the development of stripes rather than spots, like on a leopard. Is which was a shorter time frame densities of the stripe pattern or attributes which make the zebra more likely to survive and pass down its genetic makeup. So these compositions of geometrical constraints and processes are fundamental for modeling the relationship of geometrical form finding during. Complexity theory formalizes the mathematical structure of these processes from which complexity emerges. So it focuses on the effects produced each other, such as atoms, molecules, or cells. So multiple connections and parts that behave differently, although they are not independent. These variations and different differentiation and integration in many scales. From the formation of and structure of an individual organism to species and ecosystems and form. And you? Are you there? We lost you again. Moscow, can you can you hear them? Guys? No? Me neither. You cannot hear him. Yeah. The drops. It's a pity because it's really interesting. I mean as you can see, I mean he's talking about forces, right? And he's talking about how we can give an interpretation to forces, starting from the understanding of living organisms and understand how those living organisms adapt to complexity, you know, by self-organizing and generating a structure that, you know, is based on the relationship with those forces. And in the city, you know, as I was telling you before, we have many, many forces that we have to adapt to, you know, a public space is a you know a combination a mix of forces that are coming from many different fields in a city i mean i mean there is a there was a project from vicente guayard in uh, 2012 in ayac developed here in ayac which was called the city protocol so the city protocol was basically some sort of a diagram that was trying to uh lay down write down all the different layers they are participating in the definition of the city from what is about energy from what is about electricity infrastructure mobility uh, habitation and so on so it was oh, okay we have uh, i was doing le meta lecture although uh, here it is all this year and uh, i think uh, ali I guess we don't we don't have a very good uh, connection uh, from there. It's a pity because it's extremely interesting the the lecture that Andrew is doing. Uh, can do you think we can try to uh, to to wrap up what he has to say in like ten minutes? Uh, Andrew, can can you do it? It's just. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, and also I will ask uh, Mosco and, and me, myself as well to turn off the, the video. So we don't, uh, we can, you know, give you more than, hopefully. I mean, let's have a last try, uh, other, and otherwise, I mean, we might record it and be even if it can be recorded. Let me just do the last try. Uh, no. They're dropping out. Yeah. I will give them seven more minutes where we finish the global lecture and then we go back to our class after class. I'm a bit stubborn because I know that I can avoid having these problems if I tell them to record. But if I tell them to record, I lose the opportunity to interact and make a question, which is more valuable than looking at YouTube video. Any one of you watch? one of the Global Summer School lectures that we did last year? By all of them, even if they are recorded. The thing is to ask directly. In fact, I didn't tell you this time, but I'm telling you, prepare a question for every Global Lecture. I want three questions from the audience. From the audience. Yeah, from the the other researchers. Okay. Aldo. Yes. I mean, okay. I'm very sorry for these things, but uh, no worry. We know that it's complicated, Ali. Uh, it's a W7 operation here, huh? No, I know, I know. But I can see you better now. I mean, you want to give a last try? Okay, one last try. Yeah, one last try. I understand that probably can be frustrating even for Andrew to do that. Yeah. Where is the presentation? So. This one, and open the this one, and then you can show open this. The, you want to show this one? Yeah. No? Wow. Open this one. So you can file, view. Hey, this is so, your file, right? Yeah, yeah but it's, it's like 30 or something. Okay. But, Page here. Where? This one. Mark Yeah, I don't know if it's. Maybe 40. Yeah, yeah. it's right there. Okay. Maybe here. All right. Yeah. 
Good luck, guys. Check with that. Uh, so, okay, you start again. Sorry. Okay, so you guys can hear me again? Yes, yes Andrew, thanks you. thank you for the patient. Okay, um, so I'll kind of recap sort of what I was saying before. Maybe I was speaking too fast and I was going in and out. So basically, we, we have two schools of thought. One is from Darcy Wentworth Thompson, who believed that um, material form takes its shape based on um, actions acting on it, or the forces acting upon it. Um, so everything in nature has a shape, uh, a specific shape, because of the gravity, of the wind, of erosion. Um, and so everything is, the, is a specific shape for a specific reason. Alfred North Whitehead, who believed that over time, um, things develop and change, and it, it takes large scales of time to, to develop this change. Um, so we use this in architecture as a way to kind of create um, differentiation and, and create computational models that can rapid design that can self-organize and develop patterns sort of on its own. Um, so let's kind of start start from oh shit. One second. Where's the presentation then? The PDF. Okay, so here we go. Um, so collective behavior of organisms can be exhibited in the group of dynamics of many natural species. So flocks of birds or schools of fish produce coherent forms without a leader or without any central intelligence. Um, insects, such as bees and termites, will produce complex built artifacts without planning or instructions. So if you see an anthill or if you see a termite mound and you knock it over and they rebuild it, they'll never rebuild the same thing twice. Because what they build is um, based on a rule set of, of if-then statements, just like when you're uh, um, scripting something or programming something in a computer, like if the wind is this strong in this direction, reinforce the termite mound in, um, in this certain way. If the humidity of the air is this much, make more airflow in this sort, sort of way. If the heat is this much, reinforce with extra sand to help insulate in a certain way. So every time you would knock down and rebuild a termite mound, it would be built differently because the forces acting upon that form um, each time is different. Uh, so these examples of structured behavior emerge from repetition and interaction of very simple rules. So complex patterns and effects emerge from the distributed uh, dynamical models. So the study and simulation of co-evolution and co-adaptation is particularly effective in exploring results for self-organization within simulated computational models. So these computational models are referred to as uh, genetic algorithms, uh, which digitally mimic the process of natural selection of individuals amongst a group. So we understand in principle that through breeding over a large population, uh, gradual changes can occur. So for example, for millennia, humans have utilized the process of how you breed seeds of a plant together so you can begin to choose the attributes you wish to exploit in each generation of individuals. So we want to receive higher yields, larger size grains, or more intense colors of a plant. It's all possible. We're all able to do it <coughs> and for thousands of years. Um, this process of human agricultural intervention with now a majority of domestic farming is guided through genetically modified agricultural processes, allowing for the ability to pre precisely develop and extract attributes that we want in a specific strain of produce. Um, another example would be 
um, selective breeding and race horses. So breeders choose um, a lucky stud to breed with a specific mare uh, based on their attributes to produce a more um, optimal offspring uh, for racing. So longer legs, skinnier frame, larger muscles, these are all attributes capable of manipulating through multiple generations of selected populations of individuals. Um, both controlled and natural selection are also coupled with natural occurrences of mutation. So developing additional advantages or disadvantages in an organism based on just natural errors in the genetic makeup on which they develop. So through computation, we can create simple rules to develop complex forms that gradually become more efficient based on our desired needs or environmental conditions to manipulate or generate form. So the first step in the process is to make a population of individuals. So if you take, a, for example, these glasses on the screen, like a base form is established and we can make a population of variations on the form. So within these glasses, all of them have a stem, all of them have a base, all of them have a mouth, but they're all shaped in different ways depending on the needs of that specific glass. So when we what we need to do is we need to choose how we evaluate and measure the fitness of the individual. So the fitness meaning the desirability of a certain attribute of that individual. So we can rank the most optimal solution from best to worst and decide who gets to live and who gets to breed to make the next generation of forms um, and who will die. So let's take this population of glasses. So these uh, aren't much unlike a population of species in nature. So how do we measure what makes an effective glass? How do we measure what's fit or what's, what one should be the survival of the fittest? Let's say um, I want to go out for a fancy night and I want to look very sophisticated, so I want a glass with a very long stem and a smaller capacity to hold a fine liquor, which will better suit the needs of, uh, let's say, a martini or something. Um, in this situation, a certain style of glass would rank and that criteria would be the fittest, would be like a martini glass. On the other hand, let's say you're like Ali and you're a beer you. drinker. And, uh, Thank you. Yep. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure that I look at the sure right I slide. Okay. Which slide? Which slide? The right I see the 39. It showed. Because you probably you um, did. Yeah. Let's because see. Probably you, are, escape. you are showing. You put it uh, full screen probably, and the slide uh, that we see we see is still the 39. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay, yeah, okay we're like, at 40. Just keep it, keep it like, like that. This. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. You can go on. You can see still? Yeah. Okay. Um, this allows me to switch, right? No, I have to make sure. We just want to go full screen. No, no, don't put it full screen. Keep it like that. Otherwise, I lose it. Because you are sharing the, okay. the this one. Okay, that's, so you, that's perfect. Right? Yeah. Okay, so so let's say there's another type of, 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 of beer drinker like Ali. And Ali likes to drink beer and he likes really big glasses of beer and he, he always goes to a packed pub and he gets a little rowdy and people bump into him and he doesn't want to spill his beer. So he needs a glass that holds a lot of capacity and has a really big mouth so it doesn't spill out. So in that case, uh, his fitness criteria is a different kind of glass. So both of the glasses that we described, the martini glass or a beer glass, they're both fit, they're both optimal for a different situation or a different environment or a different desire. So all of these things are things that we can measure and evaluate to come up with the decision for which is best based on specific criteria that we choose as designers. So the individuals can be ranked from best to worst, and you can allow which glasses get to live and die. And it's us as designers who get to choose that criteria. So it requires us to choose what we want to happen and evaluate the results to choose the most optimal designs. So what does all this have to do with architecture? 
Architects, as architects, we can set up variable conditions computationally to be manipulated thousands of times or tens of thousands of times and evaluated based on certain criteria to pass their genes onto the next generation. So what kind of ways can we evaluate an individual building or assembly within a city? Really, there's kind of endless modes of evaluation. It all depends on how in-depth as a designer we want to go. So we can measure uh, the amplitude of the variations of height. We can check the proportion of the open spaces of a solid. We can uh, look at the orientation of the open spaces in, in relation to the wind to maximize. Uh, we can look at the contained volume relative to a surface or the surface exposure to the sun to minimize solar radiation. Uh, we can look at the surface material that um, is water or grass and what parts are impermeable, the built area in proportion to the unbuilt, closeness of buildings to each other, and the ratio of the perimeter to the horizontal surface cuts. So all of these things are just scratching the surface of the possibilities of what genetic algorithms and the use can be within architectural design. So then the question is, how can you utilize these methodologies at a city scale? So how can evolution of each building at a local scale accumulate and grow to cohesively develop to be more adapted to the specific needs of the inhabitants of the future city? Through the interactions of multiple elements that combine to a variety of assemblies, some assemblies will survive and go on to form naturally selected holes, while others collapse and the system undergoes further evolution. It heats itself at higher and higher levels, producing an emergent hole at one level and becoming a component of another system emerging at a higher level. What can make this process even more interesting is that just as a natural selection, the process could be more than a single system and actually it'd be a distributed process with multiple systems co-evolving with partial anonymity and some interaction. The levels of morphological complexity can be produced even more dramatic and dynamic results. Self-organization of the ecology as a whole is, is as critical as the morphogenetic self-organization of an individual within it. The concepts and mathematical techniques to produce collective behavior from simple local responses have a potential to radically change architectural environments. These self-organizing capabilities of distributed dynamic systems have produced intelligent behavior and natural organisms, and their application to large-scale computational system simulations has only just begun. So to answer the question, what is it that emerges, what does it emerge from, and how is emergence produced, we can say the following. Form and behavior emerge from the process of complex systems. Processes produce, elaborate, and maintain the form of natural systems, and those processes include dynamic exchanges within the environment. There are genetic patterns in the processes of self-generation of forms and, for and in forms themselves. Geometry has both a local and global role in interrelated dynamics of pattern and form and self-organizing morphogenesis. What does it emerge from? The system from which form emerges and the systems within individual complex forms themselves are maintained by the flow and energy throughout the system. The pattern of flow has constant variations adjusted to maintain equilibrium through feedbacks in the environment. How is emergence produced? Natural evolution is not a single system, but is, it is distributed with multiple systems co-evolving in partial autonomy and with some interaction. An emergent whole can be a component of a system emerging at a higher level, and what is a system at what, what and what is a system for one process can be encapsulated in an, in the environment of another. Emergence is of, mon, is, is of uh, monumentous importance for the future of architecture and urban growth, demanding substantial revision in the way we typically produce designs. We can use mathematical models outlined this evening for generating designs, evolving forms, and optimizing structures through morphogenetic processes within computational environments. 
We want to find a truly sustainable future through our buildings and cities. We must look past the simple greenwashed consumer building products and non-optimized building strategies and focus more on intelligent behavior of buildings and their group assemblies that have been much more efficiently developed and maintained by the collective behavior of, dis of distributed uh, dynamic systems. With the advent of urban sentient systems of big data analysis, cities are within the horizon of systematic change. From the design of individual signature buildings to urban ecology in which evolutionary designs are, have sufficient intelligence to adapt and communicate in the design development, truly intelligent cities will begin to emerge. So from this research, I brought, I, I continued my, my uh, research from the Architectural Association to Hong Kong University back in 2014, where I was an architect, when I was a research assistant for Tom Burbeis. And we received a grant from the Hong Kong Research Grants Council to uh, produce a new urban system um, for Japan uh, that used this sort of methodology to develop and grow kind of a, a more uh, adapted city for its environment. So we initially looked at different ways in which we could quantify and understand urban systems to extract numerical data from it to <clears throat> have that be design drivers for how uh, the system could be evaluated, for what, what its, what its uh, uh, fitness criteria could be for it to evolve and grow. So we looked at things like integration of road networks, uh, density, um, uh, relationship to road networks, relationship to public nodes, to uh, public transport. Um, I think we looked at over 20 different criteria, and then we used that to design and develop different ways in which the system could grow. And it was us as designers that got to choose what it was that we like, what attributes we liked and what attributes we didn't like. And it ended up uh, developing and growing um, over tens of thousands of different iterations to kind of create a most optimal uh, set of, uh, of solutions that we could then choose which it was that we wanted to uh, develop and, and, and grow further. Um, this was part of, a, as a, of an invited competition of 20 architects. We made it through the first round and then uh, we didn't make it to the second round. I think uh, Reiser and Wimoto ended up winning this competition. I think Zaha's and Foster's both submitted proposals, but neither of them uh, made it through the first round. Um, but it was a very interesting way to try to apply uh, genetic algorithms and uh, computational design at an urban scale to try to best develop and fit um, uh, buildings in a master plan within an already existing urban context. Um, I thank everyone for their time. I'm sorry about all of the technical issues or if uh, it was hard to understand or hear, but um, I, think, I think there's lots of potential in the way that we try to understand how mathematics um, and morphogenesis can develop um, our urban systems. And uh, we're kind of only scratching the surface of what's possible as computation um, and computer systems get stronger. Thank you so much. Okay, I guess I guess we have uh, time just for a uh, small uh, one round of questions. First of all, thank you for the uh, extremely inspiring uh, lecture. It was uh, I mean, even if we had some issues, I guess that I mean we all learn from it. So thank you. I, yeah, I also showed the uh, slides later on, so. If now, so I was saying that uh, I would like the students to make uh, one question, but they, we just started. Um, do you guys have any question? Okay, uh, you can think about while I do the, my question. Uh, Russia, do you have any question from your side? Okay, I can start. I mean, uh, I'm just curious, I would like to ask, 
which are the limitations that uh, you see in a system like that? I mean, in order uh, for an organism to adapt, you know, and uh, find this equilibrium between the forces, right? Uh, you have to some, somehow you have to um, which are the parameters where uh, is reacting to, right? Uh, somehow there are some rules of reaction that uh, extremely control at the end, or not control, but they help to define the final conformation, right? So I'm yeah. just curious about asking you, which are the limitations uh, very beginning of this process? Because you talk about optimization and uh, fitness functions and genomes. They freeze. Um, okay. Let's see if they come back. Moscow? No, they're back. Moscow, can you see them? Turn on the, the video now. No, not really. I can't see them. Okay, okay, good. But. Uh, Likun? Likun, are you there? Oh, okay, okay, I see you, I see you. Okay, just to sum up, my question was uh, how flexible is the system that you have to uh, define in order to, uh, you know, to be the more open as possible to the different opportunity, the different conformation that, uh, you know, the final outcome should be somehow uh, representing. So, you know, how, how much is a top-down approach where you predefine the parameters where your system is adapting to. I, I think that's exactly kind of the big limitation at the moment is uh, everything uh, is within sort of a, a certain parameter that you establish. So, um, you know, you can say evolve uh, your shape between this extreme and this extreme. Um, and that's you as a designer kind of choosing what you're establishing the extremes as. You know? So it's really, uh, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a guided evolution rather than in, in truly in nature. Nature doesn't have uh, a, a pre-established a, a, a pre set of forms that it can create or a limitation of what it can be within. It just evolves based on what is needed. Although I think, you know, in architecture, we're really kind of uh, behind when it comes to genetic algorithms. Uh, you know, engineers have been doing it for 40 years, and computer scientists have been doing it for 20 or 30 years to develop AIs that can evolve themselves um, and develop new ways of evolving. And the way that we, as architects, are most of are doing it currently, it's pretty rudimentary. We're not. Uh, we're kind of just at the beginning of fully understanding what what the possibilities are and how we can um, and use from computer scientists and from engineers to create non evolutionary and I think it will take uh, you know or so before we can truly get sort of a mixture of uh, science to the limit of what we're playing with now, whether it's a con whether it's a something as simple as Galapagos or octopus to a custom scripted uh, genetic algorithm in Python or something yeah. like that. No, but I feel like you know, I will uh, will go through through octopus and Galapagos with the students, so they will uh, have a, uh, a short taste of uh, genetic optimization. Uh, but probably, you know, with machine learning and the opportunity to uh, evolve the fitness function, so the target, you know, basically of your own uh, code, we might uh, probably introduce a, a more open, flexible strategy of design where we don't pre-establish right away all the parameters or the range, the domains of uh, the control, the evolution of our system. Possible option. In any case, uh, 
Um, do we have any more question, guys? Okay, we have a question. Oh, one second. Okay. Um, hi. I'm just wondering um, if this is so, um, I, I mean, if there's any opportunities where these models have been developed and then tested or like what have been the differences between the model itself and the like the simulation and then the reality if or is it still too early in the stages of any of these like a bit freeze <laughs> Quest <laughs> we can wait a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> That's a weightless cable, right? Yeah. I mean, it depends because it's it's about cities. Yeah. Uh, I will go through it tomorrow with you. Okay. But uh, I was involved in a very similar project, but not for a school, but for a municipality. So we actually developed uh, an evolutionary system that could adapt some urban roads to external forces of energy, radiation, thermal analysis, daylight, and they did. And then, Andrew, you, you can start to reply if you want to the question. I don't know if you get it. We can just uh, start. Under you may need to repeat the Okay. So this is the evolution of the structure we're gonna do. Uh, okay, so the, the question uh, was uh, was regarding if there is any uh, real application of a, a system like that. Mm, you know, did, did uh, anyone ever uh, associate evolutionary solvers to a real case scenario at the urban scale or architectural scale? Do you have any example about it? I, come, I, I just give a for specific architecture projects. I can't <laughs> off of like, off of like the top of my head, but it's something that's used by nearly every architectural engineering company. I know that in SOM, for when we uh, all of our structural systems are all. Over the algorithm softwares that are specific for uh, teams will also use genetic algorithms for the development of uh, facades. So maybe the oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm gonna mute. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me still? Yeah. Um, so maybe for the, the overall shape of the building to twist it or move it in a specific way to uh, reduce solar gain. Or let's say we have a, a tower that's 90 stories and it has something like 10 or 20,000 individual glass panels on it. Each individual panel can be uh, evaluated and optimized so that um, you you reduce the you reduce it to maybe six different panel types, and from those panel types, levels of solar radiation can be admitted. So you have um, uh, what's it called? Um, um, insulation uh, than others, so that uh, it can it can keep out more heat in the sunny areas, and then you can use cheaper glass in the shaded areas so that it's less required. So, uh, so it's used on a, a on on a very wide basis at a lot of offices. I know Foster's and Zaha's and SOM, Gensler, KPF. A lot of the major offices all have teams uh, that that use this sort of optimization uh, strategy for uh, both efficiency and for form finding. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for the reply. I also will show them some examples in the next days. So, yeah. 
that's that's a perfect uh, introduction, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if we don't have any yeah. other question from Moscow, I guess we can global lecture the first global lecture. Sure. Cool than last year. Ali, one better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we keep suffering even yeah. next year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, right. that's good in any case okay guys so uh, next appointment for the global lecture is on wednesday okay try to to be there at three barcelona time okay yeah All right, let's goodbye see the, the audience here's the china audience <laughs> here you can see the barcelona audience Say hello. 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 Hello.